Hello all. Welcome to the second chapter of Unit 2. In this chapter, we would look into detail about the DC response of a of an inverter. We'd look at uh, the noise margins, which I have been talking about in the last chapter as well. We look at the transient response, uh, the delay estimation, and we look a bit into logical effort. The major part of the logical effort will be in the next chapter, in the continuing chapter. This is more like the this chapter is very much like the analysis we do for the RC circuit for the usual RC circuits. We calculate the DC response. We calculate the transient response. We look at how does the output current rises and falls? How much time does that take? So, okay, this is uh, the review of uh, the concept we have studied earlier. So, just uh, uh, review in your mind and try to answer these questions. What happens when the width of a transistor increases? What happens to the current? Will it increase or decrease or will not flow? What happens to the length? If the length, length is increased, what happens in case of a supply voltage? Uh, let, let's look at each of these answers. Uh, so, if we remember, if we review the equation of the current, the current depends on the W by L ratio. So, if the width of the transistor increases, the current will increase because current is directly proportional to W. If the length of the transistor increases, the current will decrease because it is inversely proportional to length. If the supply voltage increases, it is very straightforward, the maximum current will increase because it is again proportional to V or the square of V of the alpha, V raised to power alpha whatever. Again, if the width is increased, the gate cap, the gate cap depends on the area. So, both in case of both 4 and 5, if the width increases or the length increases, in both the cases the gate capacitance will increase. If the supply voltage increases, the gate capacitance will be unchanged because obviously the, the capacitance does not depend on the voltage, it is the it is characteristic of the perimeter and the area and the permittivity of the of the weight dielectric material. So the capacitance does not depend on the voltage. I hope uh, we remember the, the equation. We will see the equation in detail in this chapter also. So, for DC response, uh, we see how does V out. So, now V out is the output voltage, V is the input voltage. For an inverter, let us see that, uh, that what is DC response? DC response is simply uh, what happens to V out when V in is either static 0 or static 1. It is very simple when V in 0, V out is VTD. If V in is VTD, V out is 0. This is the functionality of an inverter. Interesting part is what happens in between. What happens when V in is switching? How fast or how slow does the V out switch? And what does that switching, the, the, the speed at which it switches? The most important thing is how fast does V out, how fast the change on V in gets reflected onto V out? That is called the delay path. That is actually the delay of a gate. A delay of a gate is very, very important in determining the performance of the circuit, which we are designing. Now, V out depends on obviously the current. The more the current or the better the rise in current, the, better, the faster V out will represent, will go to VDD or V. It depends on the transistor size. We saw in the slide earlier that the current depends on W by L and few more factors. Now we'll try to solve this equation. So by uh, the Kirchhoff current law, uh, simple that the IDSN should be uh, should be equal to IDSP. So at, at, as the node V out, uh, since both are in the same direction, we say that IDSN is equal to absolute of IDSP. This way we could solve the equation that is we keep uh, the on one side we keep the equation of the for the current of the PMOS, on other side we keep the equation of the current of N MOS. It is not a simple linear equation, so, but but it can it can be solved. But we will look at the graphical solution, which is which gives more insight into what happens during the switching. So uh, let's uh, now 
we we should will really try to answer the question as to what regions we we saw that each of the transistors in MOS and CMOS they operate in one of the three regions cut off linear or saturation so we will see what happens to what regions do the NMOS and TMOS operate in during the switching and during the other voltages we we'll try to answer this question so let's review the three regions which we studied earlier let's review that once so what happens when so the three regions are cut off linear and saturated so the equations governing this are is if the gate voltage is less than vt the threshold voltage the transistor will be cut off if for both linear and saturated the gate voltage should be greater than the threshold voltage but if the if the voltage between drain and source is less than vbs minus vt then it is in linear mode if it is greater than then it is in saturated mode do you remember that the channel gets pinched off near the drain and this pinch off is what causes the current to get saturated the saturated current for an ideal case does not depend on vds but we saw that the actual transistor the semiconductor transistor the current does increase a bit with vds the suffix n here just represents the nmos this is differentiated from the tmos this will be to the other side so uh, uh, here the v in is nothing but the vdsn and the dsn is nothing but vr let's look at uh, so the what what uh, the author has done here is he has converted the vgsn into vn so that the equations are now in terms of vn and vr why is that because vn is common to both the both tmos and nmos similarly vr is common similarly uh, exactly same equation for for tmos just the uh, the polarities become different so vgsc should be greater than vtp again similar equation we again convert them into into v in now here the uh, difference is that the gate voltage here at gsc is uh, v in minus vdd this is just to make sure that the voltages the values remain positive so we have converted the vdsp to be v out minus vdd and uh, vgsp to be v minus vdd since the uh, the threshold voltage of tmos is negative so these are the equations that are converted here so since uh, uh, as i mentioned that vtp since it's negative value so uh, we in should be greater than vtp plus vtp this is uh, you can put in this equation of vdsp here here so back we can we can put these equations back into this to to get this equation correspond with this equation and this equation so this is just to make sure that the voltages uh, are in positive range for analysis we will we'll see how does that affect the graph so these are the uh, so on the uh, on the axis on the x axis we have vdd and then the voltage which the maximum value is going to be v on the y axis we plot the i this is a typical iv curve if you notice that if you take nmos into isolation this particular quadrant we have seen earlier this quadrant this quadrant we have seen earlier this is the iv characteristic of a single transistor it is not different than when earlier we saw that how how this this is the linear region and this is the the saturated region and we saw the dependence on vds that which increase in vgs the idsp increases in in saturated it becomes almost constant now since the voltages and currents are negative for pmos this quadrant here this quadrant is for pmos if you take the mirror image they both are they are very similar figures now uh, we saw earlier that the mobility of electrons electrons being higher the electrons move faster than the holes so to make the inverter balanced that that means to make the pmos carry the same amount of current as nmos we have to make beta n is equal to beta p 
how do we do that beta is nothing but mu on w mu on c of w by l since mu n mu n is greater than mu 2 we make w of e mos wider than the w of n mos so e mos is wider so that we to make sure that beta n is equal to beta p and the currents are equal in both the direction now what is done in this slide and so what what happened in this is equation is that we are converting the pmos voltages to positive value what we are doing is that we are in terms of graph what we are doing is we are taking this quadrant here and overtapping it with this quadrant here in other terms we are solving equations by taking this these values this v in v out equation here and the v in v out equation for n mos which is the v in we are taking these n mos and p mos equation for v in and v out and plotting them on the graph and the equation and the graph looks like this after conversion this is a very very interesting graph which shows how the how the current how the n mos current and p mos current vary with input and output input voltages and what happens to the out so uh, this is this is the output voltage this is the output current idsn is the n mos current absolute value of idsp is plotted here the uh, id uh, the p mos current is represented in blue the n mos current is represented in green obviously at any particular input voltage idsn should be equal to idsp uh, so for a given v in we plot now v out must be where currents are equal because the currents have to be equal since whatever is being drawn from the vdd again has to go into ground so the currents are equal it satisfies kcl so the v out the output voltage can be calculated from this graph at a point where the currents are equal now let's see the different points the different voltages and what happens to the current Let's look at V in zero. Very clear. If V in is zero, let's go back to this compound graph, for example. So, if V in is zero, this is V in zero point. V in zero zero voltage. V in one volt. V in two. V in three. V in four. For example, this. So, this is in this direction. The V in is increasing for P mos. So, N mos in this direction. V in is increasing. So, when V in is zero. the output voltage is vdd the p mos is turned on the n mos is turned off so for this graph you don't see any green line you only see the blue line which is represented by p mos so it's very clear when v in is zero the out is vdd this so this is the curve what happens to what happens to the current so the current uh i'll come to that later let's first see the effect of voltage okay. next what happens when the beam starts rising when the beam starts rising up to the point that it doesn't cross the vt of n mos the n mos will still be turned off it will be cut off and p mos uh, again p mos is uh, the one which is driving so vdd is again, v out is again vdd obviously on this line and the transistor we will see what stage the pmos is and what stage the imo uh, the nmos is in. but the one thing is clear that since the voltage does not does not cross vt the nmos does not start conducting there is a very faint green line here which uh, we won't see in this graph we will see that in the next form what happens when vdd v in is 0.4 degree now the nmos has started turning on the nmos has started turning on 
the t mod in is in some region the linear situation we see that and the two curves intersect here so the out will be now slightly less than the now see the in is increasing from 0 to the dd v out will start falling which is the inverter functionality again we see that whenever v in is 0 0.6 v dd now we see that the v in is more closer to VDD than it was closer to VSA. So now the NMOS is turned on. TMOS is kind of going into turn off. So we will see V out, which is very close to V. Right. So V out again, we remember is the point where the both the curves intersect. So in case of if, if somebody is confused, what happens? Then, so in, the, in this graph, the the IDSN is actually zero flat along the x-axis. So this is the red point represents the intersection of VDD. So we again again view this V in zero, the VDD is zero. The IDSC graph is represented by the blue line. V in starts increasing, VDD starts decreasing, and MOS starts turning on, the MOS starts turning off. And at Vn is equal to 0.8 VDD and higher. The uh, blue line is now along the x-axis because the Vmos is almost turned off completely. And Nmos is the one driving the V out. So, so Vn. So for Vn4, VDD is nothing but zero. The same thing happens. Uh, if the process completes and Vn is equal to V. So when Vn is equal to VDD, again IDSN. Uh, Represents uh, IDS in this curve and VD uh, and V out is 0 for V in is equal to V2. Now let us look at uh, so this is again the, the same graph the load line summary. So at, at any point of uh, V in either you could use the equation or you could use the graph. The equation is for more accurate analysis if you want to know the current value at each and every point. The graph is more intuitive into understanding that what happens during the switch switching of inverter. Now, uh, earlier the plots were IV curves, which means it was showing the current with respect to voltage. Now, what we plot here is V in versus V out. If V in increases, what happens to V out? So all the points what what we described earlier 0, 0 0.2 VDD, 0 0.4 VDD, 0 0.6 VDD, 0 0.8 VDD and VDD are plotted on the input line and we see V out here. So now five regions are defined A, B, C, D and E. In the, so this is a typical inverter functionality assuming assuming this region this region here. It's very very narrow around VDD by two. On the left of this region, V in is logic level one or VDD, and uh, sorry, V in is sorry, V in is zero, and V out is logic level one or VDD. And on the right of this this point, V in is VDD and V out is zero, which is the red line. Typical inverter functionality. Now let us revisit the regions. So in region A, region A, V in is 0 or close to 0. What happens to NMOS and PMOS? The NMOS is in cutoff, PMOS is in linear. So very important thing to remember is that in, in, in static state, Whenever pull down or the NMOS is in cutoff, the PMOS corresponding PMOS will be in linear region, region A. Region E, the, the reverse, PMOS is in cutoff, is in linear NMOS. So, either NMOS or PMOS during the switch in will go from cutoff to saturation to linear. Why this happens? Now, the drain voltage is constant here what is uh, what is changing is the gate voltage the input voltage so when input voltage or the gate voltage is, is low 
the drain voltage being higher pushes the transistor into saturation and when the gate input gate input keeps increasing the vs sends it the, the, the transistor comes out of the pinch of vs and goes into linear the thing to remember here is that at at the uh, the logic levels of vn being 0 and 1 the either the pmos or nmos one of them is a linear other other, other one is in the cut off now uh, what we'll do is we will we'll play on this curve we will play on this curve we will we'll see how this curve is useful in understanding the noise margin and understanding the delay and so on now this curve uh, this curve can be skewed by making by playing with the beta p versus the time value if it is not equal to 1 now in the in the previous slide we saw that the switching point is very close to the zero This, this this is the switching point, and this uh, the voltage the shift in voltage is almost instantaneously here. This is for the case where beta n is equal to beta b. That means we have made C MOS wider compared to N MOS to make the current equal. But if it, this is not the case, this, this curve, the middle curve is for beta one. If we start increasing beta p by beta n, that means we start making C MOS wider. then this gate becomes skewed in the sense that the cut off point starts moving away from vgd by 2 if beta p is the pmos is wider then v out obviously v out it will be difficult to it will take more time into or rather it will take more voltage to make convert pmos into from a region of fully on or in linear to saturation to cut off so let's consider this curve this curve here now this case this is the case of beta p by beta n is 10 that means pmos is very very is, is compared compared to nmos is quite wide 10 times as wide so the pmos will remain the for a higher very let's let's Take it down there. Okay. For a majority, for a major part of the beam to VDD ratio, the PMOS will remain in linear region that is on, and NMOS will remain in cut off for this major part of the curve. For the minor part, obviously the, uh, the NMOS will be on. Similarly, this is the the case. Similarly, this is the case where N MOS is quite it is again ten times as wider as as P MOS, and uh, so this 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 case is the reverse of this case, where for the major part of the curve, this is the major part of the curve, the N MOS will be turned on and P MOS will be turned off. So we see that by playing with the beta values or the width of the transistor. We can control the time it takes. So, so let's see. So we will we'll look into the time factor later. But we can control the the skew, the the, the slew of this this curve. And uh, these gates, which are not balanced, that is for beta and for beta just in this curve, this part of the curve. This kind of gate is not a balanced gate. It's called a skewed gate. How do we analyze other gates, other complex gates? We do the similar kind of exercises. And they, these gates also get collapsed into an equivalent inverter. So when we talk about the uh, the skew factor in terms of other gates or the how wide the N MOS and P MOS should be, we always compare it with an equivalent unit inverter. Uh, and I'll come to what what unit inverter is later. We will discuss uh, some things about unit unit inverter earlier, but we'll see that again. Now let's talk about noise margins. noise margin why is it important for any gate we have to make sure that a small amount of noise should not corrupt the value at the output of the gate now let's let's study two inverters that are connected back to back so let's say the uh, 
the inverter, uh, the first inverter. So the ideal voltage is the VDD and GND. And these are the ideal voltage VDD and GND. Now let's say the output of the first inverter voltage here is let's say slightly lower than VDD. We call this as VOH. In case the the value here is low, voltage level low. Then it's not actually GND. It's somewhere higher than GND. Let's call it VON. What it means is that we are introducing some noise here, which is eating into the logic level. If the let's say if the input input here let's say it goes high, the, the output here goes low, but it doesn't go low as low as GND. It goes only till VON. If the input here goes low, goes low. Then the output doesn't necessarily go to VDD; it goes to somewhere the UH. Now let's say we uh, we define two more terms called VIH and VIL. What it means is that the inverter here, for this inverter to recognize, for this inverter, this second inverter to recognize this value as one. It is sufficient that it should be between VIH and VDD. I'll explain that in detail. I'll explain more in detail. But let's assume that this inverter, if given a voltage between VIH and VDD, it is able to resolve as logic level one. Similarly, if we give a voltage between VIN and GND, it is able to recognize this as logic level zero. So we say that the logical high input range of this inverter is this one, is this wide. Similarly, logical low input range is this one. So for the second inverter, the noise margin, the margin it has, the lowest the input can go is VIH, but actually it is going up to VOH. So the margin it still has for high region is NMH, which is the difference between VOH and VIH. Similarly, the margin on the lower end is NML. This is the difference between VOR and VIN. Now let's look at logical high input range. In the previous slide, we saw this curve. Now, now consider consider an input value, the VIN, to be somewhere here, uh, somewhere here, right? Now we see that. For this range, let's say to till point VDD to B. For this range of V in, that means V in can be higher than zero, and still the inverter will produce an output of V. This is called the range. That means the inverter is able to take some noise into account. Now, inverter is a digital circuit. It operates in either zero and one, but the zero does not mean it always has to be VDD. It always has has to be GND. It can be some voltage above GND, and still the inverter will recognize this as logic level zero. Same thing happens for logic level one. This range decides the logical high input range and logical low input range. Okay, now the gates should obviously be designed to withstand large levels of noise. So, how to maximize noise margin? Let's say, for example, in this case, beta p is greater than beta n, um, greater than one. This is to balance the inverter, and the uh, the curve slopes here. This is these are the two points. These are the two points where the curve, the, the slope is minus one. That is, it's uh, one thirty five degree slope is there on this on this curve on the on this tangent. Will we draw a tangent? And we say we define these parameters here. VOH is this, and this is VIL. Again, VOL. So, so remember the x-axis is the input voltage, the y-axis is output voltage. So, what we are defining here is that we say that at these slow points, the output changes from VDD and immediately goes into a very sharp. Region. This is a very sharp transient region, so we don't want to go into this. 
we want to restrict the RCL to this 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 particular region. To this particular region for input voltage zero. The voltage here we define as ZOH corresponding input voltage. This is this is the output voltage corresponding to this slope. This is the output voltage. This is the input voltage. So we call this UH and VIL. Obviously, when O high because this is closer to VTD. I low because the input is closer to this. So for this input range, this is the VIL. Similarly, we have a similar slope here. This is VOL and VIH. So at these two slope points, if we design the inverter, these level logic levels. For a unity gain point, it will have the maximum noise margin possible. Again, why is noise margin important? Noise margin is important to make sure that small disturbances in voltages don't cause wrong logic levels. Uh, I uh, request all of you to go through this this curve. Uh, actually, uh, the best thing would be to. Make a unity gain inverter. Plot uh, uh, the DC transfer characteristics of a of a inverter which has beta p adjusted so that it's equal to beta n. Or no, not not beta n actually twice of that or let's say one point seven times of that to make sure the currents are equal. You draw this graph. This graph is very easy to draw. Easy to plot. You just give v in and change v in and calculate v out. The spice will do that for you. And then you could actually calculate the values of VOH and VOL, VIL and VIH, and that would give much more insight into the working of the inverter and the noise model. So DC analysis told us what happens to V out if V in is constant. The transient analysis is very important. That will tell us what happens when V in changes, how fast or how slow does V out change. Go back to the RC circuits. Uh, the RC or the RL circuit is nothing but a first order differential equation. Similarly, we would have a differential equation here. Input is usually considered to be a step or a ramp. A step input is ideal case. A ramp input is the most more practical case from zero to VDD or vice versa. So let's see uh, this inverter here. Now it's important to we will we'll look at IDSN. V out will see some load. Which will be represented by P load, capacitor load. This load is just the the drain cap of both, or or it could also represent the fan out load of let's say an inverter or or, or any, any gate. So that we saw this earlier but during RC model, but whatever load is on V out is represented by C load. So V in we are we are looking to find the step response. When we talk about step response. V in will change from V in can be represented by U T minus T zero V D D. U is nothing but the step response input. That means U will rise. V in will rise at T zero. It will become one. Before T before time is equal to T zero, it will remain at zero. V out T is less than T zero. If V in is zero, V out will be one or V D D. dv out by dt let's look at the uh, equation so dv out by dt dv out by dt uh, is nothing but is uh, negative of idsn by load by c load so uh, is this, the formula is simply i is equal to c dv by dt so the v we solve for id so what happens when t is less than t0 We will look for three regions here. T is less than T zero. V out is greater than V D minus V two, and V out is greater is less than V D minus V two. So for T is less than T zero, obviously V out is V D. It's connected to the pull-up network, not to pull-down network. So the current through N MOS would be zero. Again, we look at these three. Now V out is nothing but V D. We look at three regions here. V out and input is nothing but V D. It's the gate voltage. Just so this is nothing but this is V D, this is V G. So if V D is greater than V G minus V T, we can write. So so this this part is nothing but this is V G, and this part is nothing but V D. Just rearrange. So V D is greater than V G minus V T. 
it is saturation you remember the saturation equation again this is into linear region this part we remember the uh, equation of the linear part this is solving for this is the id values now we have to solve for v out knowing the id values we could easily plug in the value of id sn here and calculate the v out this graph here shows what happens to v out v out when v in changes suddenly obviously v out will go to zero after some time is the pull pull down network is being active now but we we, we are looking to uh, to find the equation for this curve so here we'll define some uh, some parameters for delay tpd means propagation delay r means rise s means fall tr means how much time it takes this for signal to rise tf means how much time it takes for the signal to fall tpdr rising propagation delay that means from input to output rising crossing vdb by 2 the rise here the rising here is referring to the rising output for any gate this can be for any gate so for an inverter a rising output would mean a falling input for let's say a buffer a rising output would mean a for a rising input so pdr is rising propagation delay from input to rising output tpdf is falling propagation delay from input to falling output tpd is nothing but average of both tr is from output crossing point to vdd to point a vdd this is the transition time for the output this is a 20 80% limit so point to vdd to point a vdd again fall time is from point a vdd to point to vdd these things uh, are arbitrary for a particular technology for a particular design somebody might decide to use the 10 90% so point 1 to point 9 and so on so these are just definitions for let's say are Uh, for one particular technology for one particular application these can be changed as the as the purpose is now tcdr is rising contamination delay from input to rising output causing vdd to vdd by 2 tcdf is the falling contamination delay i will come to what hap what is this contamination delay this contamination delay for example is not applicable for inverters it's only applicable for complex gates so uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, spy simulation of an inverter i would uh, recommend all of you to do this yourself using the spy tool obviously spy will not use your simple shockley first order model or a simple alpha model it will use a much more complex and accurate iv model uh obviously simulations are not that easy to write but once you are familiar with you can write basic simulation at least you can write you can write a uh, you can simulate a step response or you can even simulate a step response in steps of 20% of vdd you can do that easily so this 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 is a graph of a spy simulation where the uh, where the time is uh, plotted here so we see the the curve here this v in is rising this is nothing but v in and so obviously when when v in is low this part of v in low vdd is high when v is high the vdd is low so according to the definition of the propagation delay the time the time here and the time here the difference in time is the propagation delay for fall that means v out is falling similarly this is the propagation delay when v out is rising Uh, so uh, i'll also show you what is the uh, the rise time and the fall time so uh, so the the propagation delay refers to the difference in time between the output and the input when output is falling or output is rising if you consider the the vdd alone so the time it takes from this point let's say 20% of vdd to go to this point let's say 80% of vdd this difference here this difference here this is nothing but the rise time similarly 
this difference here is the fault time. So these two, uh, I request you all to to again again go through this to revise this such that these concepts are very clear of the propagation delay and the rise and fall time. These are very very important factors in determining the quality of a gate, quality of a design. Now uh, we we realize that solving equations or doing five at a time is not straightforward thing. It's not very easy for every gate. So how do we quickly compare? Different designs or delays. We saw one thing earlier. We saw an Arthur's lay model earlier, which is used to estimate delay on paper. It's a very good tool. So uh, this this the point here says that we use Arthur's lay model to estimate delay. It's a very useful technique. Propagation delay is proportional to R C. We also characterize transistors by finding their effective R. So The effective R depends on the average current that we get with it. Let's look at RC delay model again. So we we talked about a unit MOS transistor and unit PMOS transistor. We say that the rule of thumb says that if a unit PMOS has a resistance of 2R, so the mobility of poles is slower compared to electron. Capacitance is same. We define the capacitance to be C. Of each gate drain and pores, uh, the capacitance is proportional to width. We represent width by k. The resistance is inversely proportional to width. So an MOS of width k will look something like this. You have capacitance k c at each of the three terminals, and you have uh, the, the on resistance to be r by k. Similarly, p MOS will become 2r by k. The capacitance will remain k c. Let's again give an example of this. Let's see a three input NAND, and how do we uh, make sure that it achieves the effective rise and fall resistance equal to unit inverter R? So now, what uh, I would do is uh, let's uh, let's look at the uh, The RC model of a three input NAND, and try to see how does it compare to a unit inverter. Now, first thing what we have to do is we have to assign width to all these NMOS and PMOSs. Now, how do we do that? I'll annotate some numbers here, and I'll try to justify these numbers. I'll justify these numbers by the width is between three two three and two two two, and then this technique can be applied to any CMOS. A static CMOS gate and width can be calculated. So let's see a, a unit inverter. So a unit inverter, nothing but a PMOS and an NMOS connected in series. So this is a PMOS here. This is an NMOS here. They are connected here. So the width is two and one. So if you remember that, this unit NMOS here will have the resistance of R, the unit PMOS here will also have a resistance of R. Why? Because the width is two. So if it's one here, the resistance will be two R. If it's two here, the resistance will be R. If it's, uh, we go back to the previous slide. We see that the uh, so the the if the width is one, so NMOS will have R by two, and if width is uh, For, for corresponding same PMOS, it will have a 2R. So by making yeah, by making the uh, the PMOS to be twice as wide, we keep the resistance to be R. Same now, same thing, same application will apply here. Now, if you see, let's say if you combine three NMOS in series, these are three NMOS in series. Forget the number three here. Forget the width. If let's say each of them was unit, so the resistance, total resistance, would be three R. Now, if we make each of these transistors wider, three times wider, what happens to the resistance? So the resistance of each of these becomes R by three, which is R by three, R by three, R by three. 
So the total resistance seen by the pull down is nothing but R. So now compare the resistance by a pull down circuit here is R, resistance of a unit inverter is R. Now we come back here, these are parallel, EMOS is in parallel, but this is a NAND gate at any given time we assume that only one PMOS would be on other two PMOS would be off it's parallel so we assume that only one is on at one time if one is on the resistance of a of a PMOS a single PMOS resistance on resistance which is equivalent to the single PMOS resistance of an inverter so it should also be R so PMOS is nothing but twice as well. Now what I would request is that go back and draw a 3 input NOR gate for example or any gate and try to calculate the width of NMOS and PMOS using the same logic and comparing it with a unit delay inverter. I repeat again the process you go to the, the, the pull down and the total pull down resistance should be R. If it is in series the resistance is add up and you will have to make the NMOS as wider to make it R. Then go to the pull up and compare the pull up to the unit resistance pull up. If it is in parallel you assume that only one of the PMOS would be active and calculate the width. So for series you will have to make the transistor wider. For parallel you might have to make it less wide or depending on how the parallel circuit looks like. So do this for one complex gate and, and compare the widths. Now we, uh, we have uh, we saw the widths of all the PMOS and NMOS now let us annotate the capacitance and resistance over it right. We will convert this to this looks very complex but not that in reality. You just uh, so a width of 3V means 3C at each of the gate inputs, 3C cap at each of the gate inputs, 3C cap at each drain and each source, right. Then uh, again, uh, this uh, the PMOS is 2C, so this, this gate cap. Now see for NMOS the cap will be with respect to ground, for PMOS the cap will be with respect to VDD. So 2C, 2C again 2C these are parallel connections, please note these are parallel connections. So 2C, 2C each will have a 2C cap with respect to VDD. Now check out one thing, 2C here, the gate, 2C, 2C yeah. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, now, uh, if you are, we are wondering, this is this is three C. This is just because it shares the contact. So, uh, we uh, because it's not contacted. So, we account only three C for one of the transistors because because the, the it shares the diffusion region. There's no contact here, as we saw on the layout. Now we combine this. We we what we do is. Uh, we use the uh, so for example the 2C with this 3C and this 2C is combined to make it a 5C because see VDD then 2C then 3C this 2C and 3C are in parallel so they will add up to become 5C so each gate will see 5C and similarly we combine the, uh, the drain and source one wherever it can be combined so each gate will see 5C. Uh, let us go back and check uh, uh, the output. So, the output here this this point C is a 3C, a 3C, 3 plus 2, 7 plus 2, yeah, this, sorry, 3 plus 2, 5 plus 2, 7 plus 2, 9. So, the output will see 9C, right. Similarly, this point will see 3C, this point will see 3C, and so on. Now let us uh, see the delay part. So we have the value of R, we have the value of C. Now this is uh, again an exercise into, into sizing. So uh, 
so before calculating the delay the first thing we should do is determine the width of the transistors second thing we annotate the c values there to calculate the capacitance seen by the output because the drive, the delay at the output determines on the output capacitance and resistance seen, right so this exercise we we'll try to size this so that this becomes is equivalent to unit inverter right now here d is in parallel so so these two are parallel connections so we assume we make sure that d has the same r as the n mos of our unit inverter so that means the width here will be 1 for example if the width here is 1 then again this these two are in series so they will be twice as wide so let's i'll put the values here in and we just say so the width of d is 1 next this should be two and this should be combined this should see combine this this is by which one means this means r this should see r by 2 and this here should see r by 2 so the width here is 2 again you have parallelism so b and c would need to be still more wider to draw the same current i'll just clean it up a bit yeah okay so since this is this part is parallel yeah so this this d is parallel to this circuit we assume only one of them will switch on so each one of the branches should have resistance r so this that's why this bit is one again this part in total should be again b and c are parallel so we assume that either of them will be turned on so when a to b is turned on you see 2 and 2 that is r by 2 to r by 2 again r or if ac path is turned on you see r by 2 and r by 2 again r so 1 2 2 and 2 similarly for pull up we see that d is in series now to a b and c again we will i will put in the numbers here so when d is in series uh let's the number will start from area yeah so when bc in series now usually the pmos is twice as wide now we assume that either let's say this will work this part will be active either this will be active or this will be active let's label it as 1 and let's label it 2 so when one is active d and a being in series pmos anyway shows at uh, a 2r usually is too wide it's twice as wide If you add one more PMOS, it should be four times as wide, so that the resistance shown here will be 2R by this is 2R nothing but 2R by 4. This is A is 2R by 4, D is also 2R by 4, or R by 2. When you combine 2R by 2 together, it shows R. Again, B and C here are in series, so this should be again twice as wide as A. So the the resistance here is again 2R by 8, so R by 4 and R by 4. Plus R by two, so this becomes R. So this way we decide the weights of each of the transistors. Uh, I request all of you to do this exercise on paper on your, uh, yourself, or you can draw any complex circuit and try and do the sizing. The purpose of this sizing is to make sure that the resistance of the pull down and the pull up network is same, and it is it is equal to a unit inverter. Right now we define a term called L mode delay. L mode delay assumes that on transistors looks like resistor. The pull up and pull down network are modeled as RC ladder. What we have been doing, and the L mode delay of RC ladder is the propagation delay. Is let's say you have a network like this, the summation of R I to source and C I across all the nodes. So the delay here would be R one C one. Plus R1 plus R2 C2 plus R R1 plus R2 plus C3 into C3. So this is a formula proposed by Elmore. This is called Elmore delay to give a very quick calculation of a delay. The delay, the numbers will not be accurate, but using this you can compare two designs. That analysis would be accurate at least. The absolute value of delay doesn't matter. So the PD. That's why we say that propagation delay can be represented by 
this this formula. This is, this is a very popular formula to compare uh, multiple designs. For example, two input NAND. Again, uh, take pen and paper and see that the bits here are actually correct according to your understanding, and the values here are correct according to the RC model. I am not going to going to go into details of the width, the calculation of width of a two input NAND, or into the how the values of uh, C are calculated here. This everybody should be able to do this exercise. Now. So we say that we try and calculate the delay, estimate the delay for a NAND gate driving H NAND gates, H identical gates. So I'll break it here. The part on the left is this NAND gate. The part on the right is this this circuit. Since it's H, and each gate input gives four C, so the the capacitance here is four C. 6C, 2C, uh, we saw how the calculation uh, we calculated earlier. So now we try and calculate. So now, uh, when one of the PMOS is on, uh, okay, let's say when when the output is rising, when will output rise? When will the NAND gate have a one input? When any of the input is zero. So we assume only one of the PMOS is active. And it connects to pull-up network. Pull-down network is not shown here, right? Uh, so this this part kind of goes away. This part kind of goes away. So that the, the capacitance left is 4HC plus 16, and the resistance on R here. So P T P D R according to Elmore delay will be nothing but R into 6 plus 4HC. Right? Now let's look at the fault delay. So in case of fault delay, the circuit will be seen is is the, the only the pull down part so again 6 plus 4 hc and we will see a 2 c this this 2 c at the gate uh, and this 2 c or so so this this part is this part and then from y it goes to a from y it goes to a r by 2 and 2 c this one is 2 c and again to b which is nothing but r by 2 so TPDF the L more delay will be so L more delay will be R by two into six plus four FC R plus R by two into two C. So it will be seven plus four FC R C. Uh, this might seem uh, complex at first, but if you go back to the L more delay formula and apply it here, it's a very simple network. So uh, this R this R by two into two C, then this R by two plus this R by two into this, this R. So the TPDF is seven plus four H into R C. This is how we estimate. So first we do the sizing. Second we annotate the value of capacitance onto each of the inputs, uh, the gates, the source, and the drain. Then we see then to calculate the propagation delay in either the right side or the fault side. We first analyze which part is active, either pull up or pull down. And then we take only the relevant part and then apply the ELMO formula to estimate the delay. Right now, the delay has two parts. Uh, we saw earlier either either the six RC that means the one at the left of it, another at the right of it. So one is the parasitic delay that means the delay which is independent of load. We saw that a NAND gate driving H identical gates at one level it sees a cap which is inherent to its gate design which is called the parasitic delay. We saw it is either 6 RC or 7 RC this is independent of load. Other is the effort delay which is nothing but the effort the gate requires to drive the fan out. It depends on the load proportional to load capacitance we saw it is always 4H RC. It would be this would doesn't this doesn't matter when output is rising or falling. It just depends on the gate capacitance of the fan out gates of the connected gate. The contamination delay. Now we have been assuming all along during the delay calculation that only by, for example for a two input NAND gate, only one of the input will fall at one time. Either A will fall and B will remain constant, or B will fall and A will remain constant. The contamination delay refers to the condition. 
where both the both the inputs are falling simultaneously and this can be much much lower than substantially lower than the regular propagation limit which means that the input will be written, will shoot to output quite fast compared to the other two cases so for calculation of contamination delay again since we are assuming that both a and b are falling so we have to uh, we have to assume the uh, we say that both of these are are active now see we have de we have determined the width 2 2 and 2 and 2 of pmos and nmos assuming that only one of the input will trans transition at one time we did not assume a contamination case assuming the widths to be same we calculate the contamination delay so the contamination delay is 3 plus 2 hrc please uh, work this this formula out and it should be easy to calculate I will not go into details again. Now, this contamination delay is usually uh, whenever the timing is calculated for the standard cells while preparing the library. This contamination delay is usually not taken into picture. Why? Is because the probability of multi of all the inputs of a multi gate multi input gate falling together is very very low. But we know this to be a dangerous case, and we tackle this in other ways. But we do not take it take into account the delay part. We are only interested in the delay whenever only one of the input is stalling. Uh, how do we tackle it during digital design is a, is a separate topic altogether. How, how do we tackle contamination delay? I am not sure this is in scope of this course, but there might be a mention of it when we do synthesis and timing analysis. So just keep this in mind that contamination delay is one unwanted factor. And uh, usually the delay part is not part of our calculation. Okay. Uh, we assume contacted this, uh, this 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 slide we discussed earlier that wherever possible, a good layout will minimize the diffusion area. For example, we saw the NAND three that layout that uh, these uh, the region where it is merged in contact with this region. We see that since the NAND uh, since this part here. Shares the uh, it doesn't need a contact since it's, it doesn't need a connection outside, so we don't put a contact here. We share the diffusion area. And that is why we say that this end mass here and then at this end mass here. Ideally, if there was a contact here and if they don't share the diffusion area, this would see three C. This would see three C. This would total would be six C. But we only say three C here because they share the diffusion area. So we are assuming that good layout practices has will be followed and. The uh, diffusion will be shared, and there will not be any contact. So this will reduce the output capacitance also. So that is why good layout practices are mandatory. So, so this is one example that which layout is better. I will leave it up to you uh, to analyze which layout is better. Uh, I'll I'll tell you the answer. Uh, the answer is is part A. Uh, please go and figure out why do I say that A is better than B, or the left side is better than the right side. Based on whatever we have discussed in the earlier slide. So uh, this uh, chapter was, I agree, this chapter was a bit more uh, complex than the earlier chapter, but it sets the tone for the coming chapter where we know now that uh, the, the first chapter concentrated on how do we design, how do we stitch and put together different team of and more to make a complex way. This chapter concentrated on how do we decide how wide the transfer should be, and plus, when we've already decided how wide the transfer should be, how do we calculate the resistance and capacitance? How do we annotate those values? How do we calculate the Elmore delay? Again, please note that Elmore delay is a very very approximate way of calculation. I will not recommend using Elmore delay in actual scenarios. It should only be used. When you want to compare two different surface styles, for example, here when you want to compare the layout on the left and the layout on the right, you could actually annotate capacitance and calculate Elmo delay and decide which of the designs is better. So Elmo delay is usually used to compare different design techniques, design techniques, not in, in the actual value of the delay is not taken. Right? Uh, in so. Uh, Please go. Uh, please review the uh, the width part where we decide the width of the MOS and the PMOS transistor carefully. 
take the circuit such as uh, the assignment is take the circuit such as the input NAND gate AY22 uh, uh, let's say two input NOR gate the define the sizes annotate the, the R and the C values and calculate the rise and fall propagation based on the number of this is the assignment for this chapter thank you all.